All right, folks, hello, and welcome to Unit 2. Let's open your books first to your stamp page. Now, I know that in your book, I think it looks like this. Um, this is our Unit 1 stamp page. We need the Unit 2 stamp page, which is a new one. So flip this page over, and then again, in your book, it, it probably looks like this. Um... So let's, let's look at our new stamp page. Label it Unit 2. And I believe, at least at the time of this recording, you should be starting Unit 2. Today should either be uh, September 8th, if it's an A day, or... If it's a B day, it'll be uh, Monday, September 11th. So that's where we are um, right now, unless something changed with the calendar after I recorded this. Uh, and we'll come back later to exactly what you're getting for your stamp today. Um, but I just wanted to make sure you knew we're on a new stamp page now because you already received your daily grade for unit one from the original stamp page. So for your daily grade for getting all your stuff done for unit two, that's a whole different page in your book. Um, and I also wanna look at the calendar. So let's take a second and look at the calendar. Um, again, depending on if it's an A or a B day, uh, today's either the eighth or the 11th, probably. And your test for Unit 2 is, again, depending on if it's an A or a B day, it's either going to be the 20th or the 21st. At least that is what has been scheduled at the time of this recording. Um, again, there will be two quizzes in this unit. And while I'm recording this, I'm not positive which days those quizzes will be. But Miss Woodlock will be able to tell you which days to write the quizzes on. And uh, if something has changed about your scheduled test day since I recorded this video, Miss Woodlock can tell you that as well. But as far as I know, here on June 5th, when I'm recording this, your test should be here. And you definitely will have two quizzes in this unit somewhere in these days. I just don't know while I'm recording this which days those will be. Um, but Miss Woodlock can tell you which days your quizzes will be on. All right, once you've labeled that, let's flip to page 59. And uh, we're going to start off this new unit. Unit 2 is about the structure of the atom. And we're going to start off talking about um, the history of our scientific understanding of the atom. So there's actually a little um, sort card foldable activity for you to do. Uh, and at this time, I want you to... Uh, pause the video. Miss Woodlock will walk you through that activity and uh, you'll glue your foldable right here. And then uh, when you unpause the video, I'm going to start talking about page 60. So page 59, you're doing an activity. Miss Woodlock will walk you through it. You'll glue it here. Then we'll move on to page 60. So pause the video. <clears throat> All right, and if you've unpaused, then you're ready to move on to page 60. So let's talk about page 60. Um, the foldable activity you just did sort of walked you through a whole bunch of information about the historical understanding of the structure of the atom. Um, it talked about a bunch of different philosophers, thinkers, and eventually scientists uh, and a lot of their experiments. We're going to focus on four of those scientists. Um, so the, the foldable kind of gives you an overview, and we're going to focus on just four of those guys as far as what you have to be concerned about for quizzes, tests, whatever. So let's start first with John Dalton. And how I want to go through this chart on page 60 and on the back of it, page 61, um, is... I want to um, color code it to help you kind of remember a little more about each one of these guys. So uh, I'm going to use 
um, red for John Dalton. Um, and you need to get four colors as well. Highlighters, colored pencils, whatever, it doesn't really matter. But get four colors. I'm going to use red for John Dalton. You don't have to use the same colors as me, but I have a reason for each color I'm using for each guy. It'll help you remember stuff, so I advise you to use the same colors as me. Um, we're going to use red for John Dalton, or at least that's what I'm going to do, red for John Dalton. Uh, I'm going to use yellow for uh, Rutherford down here. I'm going to use yellow for him. Uh, for this guy Thompson, I'm going to use orange. Oh, no, not orange. I pulled the wrong pencil out. I'm going to use brown for JJ Thompson. I'm going to use brown. Um, and for our last guy, Niels Bohr, um, I'm going to use my pink highlighter. So, uh, he's on the, the next page. Um, so, you don't have to use the same colors as me, but um, I have a reason for each color I'm using as kind of like a lending itself toward a memory trick. So, um, just make sure you get four colors though. Because uh, each color will help you keep straight the different things about these guys. Okay, John Dalton. I'm using red for John Dalton. And uh, John Dalton is um, the first, I guess you could say, modern scientist who really had an atomic theory. Uh, and the reason I'm using red for John Dalton is because he had some basic postulates um, that's a fancy word, postulate. Maybe we should write that word down. Um, a postulate <clears throat> is basically a theory. There's a little more to it than that. There, there is a difference between a postulate and a theory. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna pretend they're the same thing. They're not exactly the same thing, but we're gonna pretend just for simplicity's sake. You'll talk about postulates in geometry. Uh, as well, and I'm sure your geometry teacher will tell you more about the difference between a postulate and a theory because it, it kind of matters more in geometry. Um, he had four postulates, uh, and we're going to talk about three of them. And the reason I'm using red for John Dalton is because um, his postulates all ended up not being true a hundred percent of the time. So I'm using red because he was wrong. Um, but what's really notable is that um, the stuff he was wrong about was all just like exceptions um, that he could have had no way of knowing about because technology had not progressed enough to prove him wrong. So uh, the first one of his postulates that I want to talk about is um, that he said all matter is made up of extremely small, solid, indivisible particles called atoms, okay, so that's one of his key postulates. <clears throat> he said that atoms of the same element are identical, and uh, please, the words I'm coloring, please also color those words. He also said that different elements look different. Um, and he said that atoms can neither be created nor destroyed. They can only be rearranged. And again, at the time that he had this theory, he had no, there was literally, it was impossible for him to know that some of these things were wrong. Um, because the, he was working in the, like, early... 1800s and the the technology just wasn't there for him to know that um, that some of this information was wrong um, later and I mean like a hundred years later um, 
is when we were able to figure out what was wrong about um, each of Dalton's things. So we're going to mark it by bullet point over here. And his first bullet, the word that was wrong was the word indivisible. So I'm going to mark that word separately and put a little X next to it. The word indivisible, it turns out, is wrong about a little under a hundred years after uh, Dalton was working, we discovered that you can, uh, well, oh, hold on, before I say that, do you know what indivisible means? Not invisible, invisible like you can't see it, that's a different word. Indivisible, like in the Pledge of Allegiance, we're one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. What does indivisible mean? Um, indivisible means you can't divide it. <clears throat> or you can't split it up. And the word indivisible about atoms turns out to not be true. You can split atoms up. Uh, you can split them up into... Um, here, we'll mark it as indivisible, put a little semicolon. Uh, it's not true. Why? Because of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Those things were not discovered um, for decades after Dalton was working. Decades and decades. Dalton was working in 1803. We didn't discover the electron until 1897. And um, protons and neutrons even were later than that. So, um, so it turns out you can divide an atom, but <coughs> the technology to figure that out didn't exist for almost 100 years after Dalton said, no, you can't divide them. Um, the... Uh, so that's, that's the first part of one of his postulates that was wrong. It turns out you can divide atoms, he just had no way of knowing that. Um, his next postulate had something wrong with it. Atoms of the same element are identical. And it's that part, same element identical, that part that is wrong. He, again, had no way of knowing that that was wrong. Um, but it turns out um, that, whoops, same elements equal identical. That part was wrong, and the reason for that is because of something called isotopes, which we're going to talk about more in a bit. Um, but the reason we know now that that postulate was wrong is because of something called isotopes. Isotopes are atoms of the same element that are different from each other, and we're going to talk about how in a bit. Um, and <coughs> the last part, atoms cannot be created or destroyed, they can only be rearranged. He's right that they can be rearranged, but it turns out this neither created nor destroyed part, matter cannot be created nor destroyed, but individual atoms actually can. So that part is the part that is wrong. Um, so when we go to write, which words are not true, atoms cannot be created or destroyed. That is not true. And the reason I know it's not true is because of something called a nuclear reaction. Nuclear reactions can form and tear apart individual atoms. And nuclear reactions are something we're not scheduled to talk about in detail until the end of the year, but basically I'm t when I say nuclear reactions, I'm talking about like what happens that makes a nuclear power plant work or what happens that makes a nuclear bomb explode. Um, part of those processes involves destroying atoms and sometimes new ones also get created. Um, radiation also uh, can destroy 
it doesn't always, but it can destroy um, an old atom and get you get you a new atom. Uh, and we'll talk about that at the end of the year. Okay. Um, let's move on to talk about Joseph John Thompson or J.J. Thompson. I picked brown for this guy. And the reason I picked brown is because he's kind of a turd of a person. Like, as a human being, he's just kind of a, kind of a turd. Um, <laughs> he, uh... He actually, like, stole a bunch of people's research and took credit for it. And while he um, he gets credit, basically, for discovering the electron, which he did technically do, but he was not the only person to do it. He's just the only person who gets credit for it because he was really good at stealing people's research and making it, um, using it to do his own and then making it look like he... Um, did things by himself and didn't need those other people and whatever. He was kind of a turd, so that's why I'm using brown, because turds are brown. Um, all right. So, J.J. Uh, Thompson was the one who gets credit for saying that atoms can be subdivided. And again, that word subdivided means divided into smaller pieces, and those smaller pieces of an atom are protons, neutrons and electrons. Now he did not know about protons or neutrons either, but he did prove, again, not the only person to do it, but he did prove that electrons existed uh, and thus that the atom could be subdivided. And today we know that it's protons and neutrons and electrons you can subdivide atoms into. He experimented with something called cathode rays which are atoms that actually, um, well, cathode rays are, are these things right here. It's this uh, instrumentation where um, basically he had a high voltage um, box that ran electricity through these kind of glass tubes uh, and it would shoot a little ray. These are called cathode ray tubes because it would shoot a little ray of um, what looked like light through the tube, but the light would respond to a magnet. So if you put the positive side of a magnet, um, it would bend the light up to it, uh, or the negative side of a, light, of a magnet would bend the light away from it, and that's how he realized it wasn't really light, because light does not respond to magnets, because light is energy. Only matter <laughs> responds to magnets. So this wasn't, that's how he knew this must not be real light, this must be some form of matter. And because it was attracted to the positive magnet and repelled by the negative magnet, he knew it must be negatively charged. So he discovered atoms actually contain these small negatively charged particles. And he called them electrons because he discovered them due to this electricity from this box over here. Um, and... Once he figured that out, he was like, okay, well, electrons are negative, but overall I know that atoms have this neutral charge, so there must be some positive charge somewhere too. And so he developed what was called the plum pudding model of the atom. Back when Dalton was working, um, we just assumed atoms were like a solid sphere, um, where the whole sphere was the same as everything else in the sphere. Thompson was like, no, I know these negative things are in there, so uh, I'm going to say that, like, we've got these little negative things floating around in the atom, little negative things just kind of floating around, and the rest of the atom is just this sort of, like, gooey crap that's positively charged, and so your positives and your negatives still balance out. This is called the plum pudding model, which he called it that because he was British, and at that point in time, I, I don't know if they still do, but at that point in time around Christmas, British people would eat something called plum pudding, which was kind of like bread pudding with plums stuck in it. Um, and uh, he thought that this looked like plum pudding, so he called this the plum pudding model. Um, 
it's wrong, and I take great joy in knowing that, because as I said before, Dal uh, Thompson was kind of a turd. Okay, uh, let's talk about Rutherford. For some reason, everyone alone wants to pronounce this guy's name Rutherford, and that drives me crazy. This is Rutherford, is how you say his name. Um, and I'm using yellow for him because he worked with gold. It's so shiny. So he used what was called the gold foil experiment. He said, um, he, well, let's look at his experiment. This is the gold foil experiment, where he had this box that emitted a, a kind of radiation called alpha particles. We'll talk about alpha particles um, again at the end of the year. But uh, it was a type of radiation. This box just sort of shot it out. And he had gold foil that he was shooting the radiation at. And um, gold foil, meaning like aluminum foil, except instead of being made out of aluminum, it was made out of gold. And he was expecting, because what he thought Adams looked like, he was going off this, like, plum pudding model. And um, so he expected, he knew that the gold atoms were very large and that alpha particles were very small compared to them. So he was expecting the alpha particles to just go between the gaps in the gold foil atoms. He thought they would just pass right through the gaps because they were just so small. Um, but a bunch of them ended up getting deflected, like they hit something and they bounced off. Um, and he knew that because he had this like detector screen that was sort of like um, photographic film. And, um, and it was getting, he was expecting just to have like a straight line where everything passed straight through. But Instead, he was finding evidence that the radiation was bouncing like all around the holes, hitting all the sides of the screen. And he was like, well, they shouldn't be bouncing off anything because the plum pudding model tells me, oh, uh, uh, there we go. The plum pudding model tells me that this isn't like particularly solid. Um, it, these electrons are even much smaller than the alpha particles. The alpha particles should be able to just like shoot straight through. Um, or pass between the, the gaps in the gold foil. But, uh, but that's not happening. What are they bouncing off of? Um, he couldn't figure out what they were bouncing off of until he realized that there must be some, like, solid, um, dense section of the atom that they were hitting if they were bouncing off. Um, and after he did a bunch more experiments, he discovered that there is a small positively charged region that he ended up calling the nucleus um, because it was in the center and that word nucleus implies center um, surrounded by the electrons and that atoms are actually mostly empty space uh, he discovered that that nucleus contains protons and he did not discover neutrons somebody else did later um, but we know now that the nucleus has both protons and neutrons protons have a positive charge neutrons have a neutral zero charge and that basically all mass of the atom is in the nucleus electrons have mass but it's so small that it's like you can barely even measure it um, so, and it doesn't really, like, contribute to the total mass of the atom because it's so little. It's kind of like saying, like, if you go weigh yourself and then you, like, pluck one hair out of your eyebrow and then you go weigh yourself again, um, you're going to have the same weight. Your scale's not going to be able to tell the, tell the difference, even though technically you weigh slightly less without that one eyebrow hair. Your scale is not going to be able to tell the difference that you're missing one eyebrow hair. And it's kind of the same idea with the atom, that you take off all the electrons. Those electrons weigh so little that um, it doesn't really change overall what the mass is.
Anyway, Rutherford's model um, was basically that, okay, your plum pudding model was that the atom is one big sphere with all these negatives floating around inside this positive stuff. And Rutherford was like, no, 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 you got this positive center. Um, and later we discovered there were neutral neutrons in there as well. So I'm going to put a little zero in here for the neutrons. And then there's a bunch of empty space where your negative electrons are just kind of floating around. Um, so empty space with all these, I'm putting little negative signs. These are negative signs because it's a negative area. So positive nucleus and negative empty um, or negative electrons floating in empty space. There's not a special name for this model um, that you need to worry about. But that's what's happening in this model. When you're done drawing that, let's look at page 61. All right, for Niels Bohr, this is our last guy we really need to worry about. Niels Bohr, he was a Danish, I think, from Denmark maybe. I could be wrong. I'm pretty sure he was from Denmark. Um, Niels Bohr, uh, working like the next year after Rutherford's gold foil experiment, um, he uh, was figuring out some more stuff about electrons, specifically. Um, he discovered that electrons existed in specific orbits, that electrons have fixed energy in energy levels. We're going to talk about that more in Unit 4. And he developed what's called the Bohr model by studying the hydrogen emission spectrum. And that's why I made Bohr pink, is because the hydrogen emission spectrum, um, which we're going to talk about more in unit four, but the hydrogen emission spectrum involves a lot of pretty colors. So I picked pink, nice pretty color. Um, and uh, so the Bohr model might be the version of the atom you remember, uh, you'd remember from middle school, where you've still got your positive nucleus, all your protons are in the nucleus, and all your neutrons are in the nucleus. But instead of the electrons just floating around in empty space, there's an energy level where you have two electrons, and an energy level where you have eight electrons, and then another one that goes up to 18, and then, you know, whatever. You can go for a while. Um, so on and so forth. This is called the Bohr model, also called the planetary model, because the um, in this model, the electrons orbit the nucleus like planets orbit the sun. Now, this is also not accurate to what a real atom looks like. Um, this is just a model that um, can be helpful for middle schoolers, but um, now you're high schoolers and you're a little more grown up, so we're going to get things a little more complicated. Um, and that complicated stuff is really going to come up more when we get to Unit 4. But, just so you know, um, this is also wrong. This is not what atoms really look like, because just, uh, just FYI, Real atoms are, th are 3D. Okay, the planetary model makes it 
kind of suggests that they that atoms are only flat two dimensional, but a real atom uh, in a real atom the electrons are not just staying flat like this they're going like in spherical motion all over the place um, there is this timeline here timeline uh, where it talks about Democritus who came up in your foldable he was working in 460 BC and then way later in 1803 you get Dalton both of them thought of the atom as being just like this solid sphere thing. Thomson later, uh, almost 100 years after Dalton, gets credit for discovering the electron, and he did come up with the plum pudding model himself. Kind of looks like this negative electrons and this positive jelly they're kind of floating in. Rutherford, a, uh, a little over a decade later, 15 years later, um, discovers the nucleus and thinks the electrons are floating around just randomly in empty space. A year after that, Bohr proves that you got your nucleus and then the electrons are stuck in specific orbits outside of that in the planetary model. And then we're not going to hold you responsible for knowing about any of these guys later, but the modern quantum cloud model came up uh, in like the 30s and later, so another, you know, 20 years after Bohr is when we started discovering atoms are actually kind of 3D and it's it's hard to kind of see in this picture, but there's these um, things called orbitals that have these weird shapes where the electrons are actually moving in 3D, not flat, um, and we're going to talk about those more in Unit 4. Okay. Um, at this point, I'm going to end this video. Um, if there's time in class, Miss Woodlock is going to move you on to a lab. Uh, and if there's not time, then we're going to skip a few pages ahead and cover some more material. But uh, uh, that'll be a different video.